good morning last class we discussed about the molecular weight and its distribution of polymers and i showed that uh, an order of uh, weight average molecular weight greater than viscosity average molecular weight greater than number average molecular weight which shows a polydisparsity in a polymer sample and the ratio of the two uh, m, m w bar over m n bar gives the polydisparsity index and values of polydisparsity index beyond 1 indicates a broad distribution. Depending on the polydisparsity value, uh, one can select a suitable polymer sample or uh, sample for uh, production of different goods. Now, there are various techniques as I mentioned for measuring the molecular weights or determination of molecular weights. Now, here is a table which shows the um, uh, different techniques like light scattering, membrane osmometry, vapor phase osmometry, electron and X-ray microscopy, isopiastic method that means isothermal distillation, ebulliometry, boiling point inhibition, cryoscopy, freezing point depression. So, and the range of molecular weights which are sensitive to each of these uh, different molecular weight techniques are shown over here. So, from this you can select. So, for very high molecular weight say ebulliometry cannot be suitable whereas, uh, for a low molecular weight membrane osmometry cannot be suitable. <coughs> Others are also end group analysis, end group analysis I means there may be <coughs> some polymer samples, polymer molecules whose end groups contain certain functional groups. Say in case of uh, condensation chain polymers, there may be functional groups like amine, halogens, carboxyl group, hydroxyl groups. So, those end groups could be analyzed and by analyzing the end groups, one can calculate the molecular weight. Details of end group analysis can be available in the book of Professor P. Ghosh. In case of addition chain polymers, and end group analysis methods can also be applicable provided initiators are functionalized. So, initiator fragment remains attached to the end of a polymer chain. So, by counting the end group, uh, one can calculate the molecular weight uh, by end group analysis. So, this way various other techniques are also available. This is for your information only. If you need in future for determination of molecular weight, you can go uh, with any of these techniques. And chromatography is a very good technique for uh, molecular weight determination, although it is a secondary method. It needs a calibration standard based on which you can get the distribution curve. From that distribution curve, you can get the molecular weight also. What is chromatography? Now, there is a technique known as gel permission chromatography. You know what is chromatography? Chromatography is a separation technique from a mixture. If there are more than one components in a mixture, those components can be separated by chromatography. There are various techniques in chromatography, thin layer chromatography, column chromatography, high pressure liquid chromatography. So, TLC column chromatography, gas chromatography, high pressure liquid chromatography and GPC. GPC is gel permeation <coughs> chromatography. Basically, in these in all these techniques, a stationary phase is used, which is highly active. That stationary phase when comes in contact with the mobile phase containing the components in a mixture to be separated, then 
there is there are some interaction occurs between the stationary phase phase and the components in the mobile phase and those components in the mobile phase which are to be separated gets adsorbed or interacted or hold by the stationary phase this way a separation can be affected. If you think of column chromatography, column chromatography is a very simple technique. You have to take a long column, vertical column, which should be packed by a stationary bed, say Sephardex, which are something say um, silica or uh, alumina particles or uh, I do not know exactly uh, say the composition of Sephardex, but it contains some stationary phase. So, that stationary phase is used for packing the column with the help of water which is used as mobile phase there or sometimes organic water mixer can also be used after packing then um, this uh, from the top of the column some a small quantity of solution is added poured onto it then uh, gradually continuously some solvent that may be a, a mixture of one or two solvents or a pure solvent that should be continuously added at the top and from the bottom with the help of a stopcock uh, this goes down while it passes through the column bed it gets separated and at the bottom of this uh, uh, column <coughs> if it is connected to some detector. So, the detector can help how many components are passing through the column at what time that is called elution time. So, this is the basic principle of column chromatography. That basic principle of column chromatography has been extended to high pressure liquid chromatography, because column chromatography technique is a time consuming process for separation of one mixture it may take few days, whereas the same can be done within an hour or even less within a uh, half an hour time or less than half an hour time uh, in, in a high pressure liquid chromatography. Basically a high pressure liquid chromatography instrument contains a column, short column like this its length may, may, might be say one feet or something like that and it is connected to a high pressure pump uh, through uh, connected with a injection port. So, in that injection port uh, the sample is injected and that pump pumps uh, takes the solvent from the reservoir and pumps through the injection port to the column. So, this way carry, it carries the uh, mixture through the column and column uh, contains a packed bed and while it passes through the column depending on the partition coefficient of the component between the mobile phase and the stationary phase separation occurs and from the other side of the column uh, it comes out which is connected to a detector it may be refractive index detector or EV detector that helps to know the separation and it gives a picture like this say if there are more than one component, it may look like this. So, each component uh, specified for one uh, spe uh, um, uh, each peak is specified for one component, say component 1, component 2, component 3, component 4. This is the elution time. and this actually uh, I be, uh, say intensity of the detector. So, this co component 1 it gives a peak like this, uh, this indicates is, this is proportional to the concentration and this is the elution time of the component 1, elution time of the component 2, elution time of the component 3, component 4 like this. So, this way it shows that it is separated. Now, it cannot tell you exactly uh, the identity of the component 1, 2, 3, 4 here. It just separates and indicates that the components in a mixture are separated. In order to know that you have to collect the uh, component or the solute present in this uh, fraction, then you have to collect means you have to isolate and then purify or as well as you have to take the solid things and then you have to go for uh, spectroscopic analysis, IR, NMR, 
etcetera. From that you can know what is the uh, uh, what is the identity of the fourth component. So, these various details are available in a book, uh, you can go through that. Now, this concept has been extended to gel permission chromatography. Basically, a gel per permission chromatography instrument contains a column which is packed with say uh, porous beads of small particle size. That porous beads contains porous beads are made of cross linked polystyrene. So, cross linked polystyrene beads are used as a packing material in gel permission chromatography. Basically, uh, there is no difference between the principle of uh, principle uh, difference of uh, principle between the GPC and HPLC, only the column packing material GPC contains packing with spherical weights <coughs> since it is porous what happens if you inject a polymer solution of dilute concentration small concentration what happens it enters the column on entering the column small molecules smaller molecules can enter into the porosity of the beads porous pore volume of the beads, porous space of the beads, while bigger molecules cannot penetrate within the bead, uh, but it passes through the inter particle space like this, it moves this way. So, depending on the size of the polymer molecules, uh, few will enter into porous beads at a faster rate, medium size will en can enter into the porous beads. Uh, lower rates, whereas biggest molecules would not penetrate at all to the porous beads. So, while it comes through <coughs> the other side of the column, then it is a separated one that means fractionated one that passes through a detector that detects that it contains so many different fractions, fraction 1, fraction 2, fraction 3, fraction 4, fraction 4, 5 like this. Now, if you have a calibration standard say uh, you have to take one polymer of standard molecular weight, known standard molecular weight. First, you have to run that uh, G, your uh, GPC with the standard molecule, standard polymer of known molecular weight, plot a calibration curve, you will get a calibration curve. Based on that calibration curve, you can know the distribution nature of your test polymer solution of which you want to measure the molecular weight. So, this is the basic thing what is done in gel permission chromatography. In fact, majority of the poly molecular weights of uh, majority of the polymers are uh, verified or known or measured by this GPC, because all the time this absolute um, molecular weight determination techniques may not be accessible to uh, each and everybody. Now, let us pass on to other part of the structure property correlations of polymer materials. Structure I mean you have to consider that a polymer molecule it has a chemical structure. Say you think of a polyester, its chemical structure is known polyethylene its chemical structure is known, polypropylene its structure is known. So, chemical nature as well as its configuration these are known from the theory. Then in order to predict the properties of a polymer sample, how this structure and configuration of polymer molecule helps. Not only that we have seen that with the increase in molecular rate of polymers their properties changes sometimes it the properties level increases or with the decrease in molecular size properties decreases. Not only that with the extent of branching 
with the extent of linearity, with the extent of non-linearity, with the extent of cross-linking, say cross-linking, less cross-linking density, low cross-linking density polymer, high cross-linking density polymer, there is a variation in properties. So, we have to know and there is, there is also variation in morphology of structure and morphology of the polymers. Now, this diagram shows interestingly, say this is temperature axis, melting temperature of polymers in degree Celsius and actually uh, oh, there is a problem in the figure, this is 20, this is 24, read it, uh, shifting of this thing. Uh, 0, 16, 20, 24. Now, there are 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 curves, this is also a curve, this is a horizontal one, this is also a curve. This curve 4, this shows the T m melting temperature of linear polyethylene. What is the x axis? It is the chain atoms in repeat unit, that means number of carbon atoms per repeat unit, try to understand you think of a polymer molecule, here the information is shows like this, in the polymer molecule what are the number of carbon atoms in per repeat unit, based on the carbon atoms per repeat unit their melting temperatures varies changes. Now, if you think of polyethylene, you think of polyethylene there is no change in melting temperature with the increase or decrease of number of carbon atoms. Whereas, in case of carb 1 which actually uh, correspond to polyureas, carb 2 correspond to polyamides nylons, carb 3 correspond to polyurethanes and carb 5 correspond to uh, polyesters. So, this is polyurea, this is polyamide, this is polyurethane, this is polyester, okay. say PET. Now, you see in this case with the increase in number of carbon atom in the repeat unit, their melting transition decreases and approaches that of polyethylene. So, is the case with polyurethane, so is the case with uh, polyester, in this case in case of polyester it also approaches that of polyethylene. That means, the spacing between the repeat your functional groups, if there is a change in spacing between the functional groups, then the melting temperature is affected. I give you a simple example, say you consider this P E T and P B T. What is P B T? P E T polyethylene terephthalate, that means glycol is ethylene there are two carbon carbon atoms in the glycol part. Polybutylene terephthalate, there are four carbon atoms in the glycol part. So, there is a difference of two carbon atoms from P E T to P B T. Obviously, the distance between two ester groups, here say suppose this is case of P E T, this is the distance in between there is C H 2 whole 2 hmm. and in case of P B T, C H 2 whole 4. So, obviously, the distance between these two carboxyl, sorry I should have drawn little this side. So, this length is <coughs> longer than this length. So, obviously, the melting temperature of P B T will be what? because methylene group this carbon chain carbon carbon bond it can rotate and it is flexible 
is highly interesting. Similarly, polyethylene, simply polyethylene, here is also it is flexible, but and this flexibility is related to it is glass transition, I will discuss what is glass transition later. So, polyethylene is flexible and <coughs> but, uh, but its flexibility is little restricted due to closure packing of the linear chain molecules because of the size of the hydrogens attached to carbon. Now, you think of a polymer where one of the hydrogen in ethylene unit is replaced by one uh, say sorry a phenyl ring it becomes polystyrene flexibility is lost. So, replacing one hydrogen in ethylene by one phenyl ring its flexibility is lost. Here you have seen the chain contains methylene group as well as one phenyl ring in polyester. If you compare this uh, polyethylene and this polyester, what happens? The melting point of this polyester P T is around 265 degree Celsius T m of this polymer, whereas T m of this polymer is say if it is H D P it is around 130 degree Celsius. Look at the difference between these two, why so? It contains carbon chain, carbon carbon bond, it also contains carbon 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 bond. In addition to this carbon carbon bond, it contains one carbon oxygen bond as well as in this molecule there is one phenyl ring in the backbone itself. Now, that phenyl ring in each repeat unit restricts its mobility. So, this becomes rigid at a main condition as compared to this one, although this is rigid because of this the, uh, your smaller size, but there are other polymers which is not that rigid. Again if you compare this polymer with this polymer, it is rigid as well as it is brittle, it is a brittle polymer, this polystyrene is a brittle polymer. Whereas, polyethylene is a tough and strong polymer, it can absorb impact energy whereas, polystyrene cannot. So, these things should be understood or known by critical examination of the repeat unit formula and the repeat unit configuration. It is not very difficult provided you know the uh, molecular formula of the repeat unit provided you know the bonding nature between the atoms in one repeat unit. You understand? Here is another representation, you see melting temperature of polymers are related to number of side chain carbon atoms. Well, if we consider that the melting temperature can vary depending on the number of carbon atoms per repeat unit between two polar functional groups. But what can happen if there is a branch structure or a branch short or long <coughs> branch attached to a backbone chain and that too what are the number of carbon atoms present in that branch chain. You see here the melting temperature first increases if the number of carbons are less. Then with the increase in number of carbons in the branch that means, for long branch long length of branch structure the melting temperature decreases further it shows an increasing trend. Why? After pushing through certain length of the branch if it goes beyond that what happens it behaves like a linear molecule that means it can uh, arrange in 
the alignment with the main backbone chain. So, for, so uh, it shows increasing trend of melting temperature beyond certain number. So, these are the things we will find that means, you have to if you want to correlate the properties say thermal properties, mechanical properties, solubility properties and other properties, we want to find out the reason why it is so, then you have to look into the structure of the polymer. If it is an unknown polymer, then you have to evaluate the chemical structure of the polymer, then you have to correlate the properties. Look at the structure, these structures are available in books. What is the structure? <coughs> it shows a formula, chemical formula representation of a cellulose molecule, which basically shows a repeated union of anhydroglucose units, these are actually anhydroglucose units. Okay. It contains both primary and secondary hydroxyl groups. Okay. Primary and secondary hydroxyl groups, uh, you can see in other way also, this may be little complicated to students from non-chemistry background, just you see you can visualize in this fashion also. This is primary hydroxyl groups, this is these are secondary hydroxyl groups present in cellulose and hydroglucose ring. Okay. Now, these hydroxyl groups enter into extensive hydrogen bonding inter as well as intramolecular hydrogen bonding. What happens then? I told you cellulose is a thermoplastic polymer, but it behaves like thermoset polymer, because we do not find any solvent for cellulose. We cannot melt cellulose. If you heat cellulose, it will not melt, rather it decomposes. Why so? Because we know a thermoplastic polymer, if we put a thermoplastic polymer in a solvent, it goes into solution. If we heat it, it softens and melts, but cellulose although it is a thermoplastic polymer, it does not because it contains extensive inter as well as intramolecular hydrogen bonding. What are those things? <coughs> so, suppose it contains OH, here also it contains OH. So, this O and H can enter into hydrogen bonding. So, there may be many because you look into these units, each and every unit can enter into hydrogen bonding with other polymers. So, total amount of hydrogen bonding, bonding or gram mole of polymer is huge. So, it does not go into solution, but it can be converted into solution provided you carry out some chemical treatment. What is that? Suppose, if we represent this cellulose as ROH, cellulose is basically an alcohol chemically an alcohol. So, if we represent a cellulose as ROH in order to make it soluble, you add carbon disulfide along with sodium hydroxide. What happens? It forms sodium cellulose xanthate. this is highly soluble in water. Now, you have read
viscose rayon, cellophane, etc. These are nothing but regenerated cellulose. How it is done? How this regeneration is done? What is the viscose process? What we do? We take sodium hydroxide solution, alkali solution, into that alkali solution <coughs> we put cotton, then we add slowly sodium hydroxide, uh, sorry uh, carbon disulfide C S 2. So, that is highly reactive at forms this kind of compound, then when it is put into an acid bath. say dilute sulfuric acid, what happens? You get the cellulose back, this is regenerated cellulose. Mercerized cotton, processed cotton, today we are using this processed cotton as our garments, this processed cottons are soft, whereas raw cotton is very rough roughness of raw cotton is decreased by this viscose process, mercerization process. Cellophane, this is nothing but regenerated cellulose film. How this cellophane is made? Joris and many other products are obtained from wood pulp. There is an industry in Bengal. they are making in huge quantity this rayon and other regenerated cellulose etcetera from wood pulp, <coughs> you will be surprised to see. So, cellulose is extracted from there by pulping, isolated by pulping, then it is interacted with carbon disulfide. There are various other techniques say cupro-ammonium. technique other than this viscose process is also available. So, if you are interested you can go through there. Now, what I wanted to say with this uh, representation, there is extensive hydrogen bonding. What happens here in this reaction? Actually this breaks this hydrogen bonds. Once it breaks the hydrogen bond, then this cellulose go into solution. Then when it is passed through acid bath, the cellulose is regenerated. Now, once the cellulose is regenerated, what happens? It cannot reform the same number of hydrogen bonds as it was present originally. And by virtue of this large number of hydrogen bonds present in this molecule, intermolecular hydrogen bonds, is this cellulose is crystalline, highly crystalline polymer. Now, its crystallinity is reduced by this viscose process, mercerization process. You can verify it. You take the X ray of raw cotton, then you take the X ray diffraction of this mercerized cotton, you will find that its crystallinity is reduced, that is due to decrease in hydrogen bond. Also, you can verify this with the help of. Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. There you will find that hydrogen bond has been decreased, extent of or concentration of hydrogen bonding has been decreased after this viscose treatment. Here is a another example of a polymer, say polyamide nylons or polypeptides. In polyamides, the helical structure in polypeptides. In proteins, the structure is solely dependent on this hydrogen bonding as well as cross linking. Their cross linking uh, atom might be sulfur and or other things, other atoms in proteins. In polyamides, the strength of polyamide <coughs> is dependent on the high polar polar interaction 
arising out of this interaction between oxygen and nitrogen present in separate different molecules. So, these this also forms int strong intramolecular hydrogen bonds. Okay. So, this intramolecular hydrogen bonds actually control its solubility in a solvent, control its melting temperature. Now, at this point I should mention that these polyesters and polyamides are manufactured or synthesized in melt condensation process not through solution process it is not possible. Of course, there is a technique known as interficial polymerization technique which can be utilized for synthesis of nylon like polymers other than melt polycondensation. And this melt polycondensation what happens once these molecules grow in size then their viscosity gets very high and it melts at higher and higher temperature that is why you have to maintain a very high temperature say from 260 to 280 or 90 degree tem Celsius temperature in the reactor. So, that it remains fluid and you can get high molecular weight nylons. So, here you see also the effect of hydrogen bonding on the molecular uh, on the uh, polymer properties they are melting temperature. The melting temperature is not all this hydrogen bonding make them crystalline make these polymers stiff make these polymers strong. Now, this nylon is so strong provided the length between two polar and uh, functional groups amide groups length between the functional amide groups if that is regulated then one can get very tough and strong polymer which is used for making uh, mechanical gears. Mechanical gears are made of this nylon self lubricating gears, self lubricating gears are made from this polyamides. Today, sometimes self lubricating gears are also made from ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Now, here you understand where from this strength comes, where from this uh, uh, your toughness comes. In case you just compare this nylon ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, polycarbonate and aromatic polyamides, polyether ether ketones, polysulfones, these are engineering polymers, polysulfones, polyether ether ketones, please note down engineering polymers, polyether ether ketones, polysulfones, aromatic polyamides, polycarbonates. These polymers are known as engineering polymers and these polymers can withstand higher temperature or their service temperatures can be very high as well as they can bear huge mechanical load without breaking. That means, these polymers are also mechanically tough not only that the dynamic properties, dynamic properties I mean device exposed to dynamic stressing or dynamic loading does not fail. That means, it can absorb this cyclic stress energy without fail. So, this diagram this picture shows an indication how that is done. Now, here you see if it is made of aliphatic chain if the, the units present between two polar units an aliphatic chain what happens aliphatic chain is flexible. So, you can get flexible structure. Now, if you want to have a rigid structure then you can place one phenyl ring here. You can have a polymer exclusively made of aliphatic chains along the backbone aliphatic units or you can have exclusively aromatic units or you can have a mixture. That means, you have the tolerability option you can design a polymer you can synthesize a polymer having both aliph aliphatic as well as aromatic units in one backbone chain as you like you can make. So, this indicates a concept say 
you are having a polymer chain exclusively linear made of aliphatic. aliphatic linear polymer. Now, along with this aliphatic units, if you have some aromatic rings placed after certain intervals in the length, then the property changes, flexibility that means, this is mechanically stronger than this polymer this is th this polymer is thermally more stable than this polymer. So, what we have got Mecha improved mechanical properties or, or higher mechanical properties higher thermal properties, but at the same time if we move like this we can uh, achieve a polymer with high brittleness. So, you have to think of the impact properties also, you have to keep in mind the impact characteristic also. We need a strong polymer as well as high impact polymer, as well as thermal stable polymer, as well as we must see that it becomes easily processable. That means, you have to think of the processability temperature at which it melts, not only that if we go for solution processing we have to find a suitable solvent, so that the polymer, this polymer goes into solution easily. But as you move from this linear structure to this kind of structure containing uh, phenyl ring, then we have to compromise with solubility, we have to compromise with the mechanical properties etcetera. This way you have to optimize, if you want to tailor the structure. Now, what happens? This way we can just lead to a structure like this. This is a single strand polymer. this is a combination of single and double strand polymer, this is a double strand polymer. <coughs> we can have polymer like We can have polymer like this, What are the characteristics of such polymers? This is soft flexible, this is rigid polymer, rigidity is increased, this is far rigid polymer, again here the rigidity and thermal stability they are compromised here these polymers are known as multi strand polymer or double strand polymer or known as ladder structure ladder polymer. This looks like a ladder, this 
looks like a ladder, ladder polymer. They are thermally stable. Why? Now, if there is some agency which can break this point, it can break this point, still polymer remains stable. The polymer is not disintegrated because the polymer chain integrity is hold through this. like this, the polymer structure is not totally destroyed. So, this is a thermally stable polymer, but at the cost of solubility, at the cost of processability, these polymers are difficult to process. One example I give you that is Kevlar used for making bulletproof jacket. is a product of DuPont. What is Kevlar? This is aromatic polyamide. Made of? We can say Kevlar aromatic polyamide. You can say Kartikeyan, why not? I told you in the class. Phenylindiamine and terithelic acid, aromatic polyamide, Kevlar, not iso. Hmm? If you take isothalic acid, the polymer will be different. It gives the highest melting point, melting transition in that series. So, you can take terithelic acid, isothalic acid. and metathelic acid, meta, meta structure, meta structure that means here you see in the para position, if it is connected in the meta position, then the molecular symmetry is lost there and that using this metathelic acid, you will get no mix. It can give you a poly aromatic polyamide film and this gives you Kevlar fiber. You write down the structure using metathelic acid in the meta position here. Okay. Also, you can have is a para substitution, para diamine. you can take metaphenylene diamine. Okay. So, this you can this way you can have all are poly aromatic polyamides, but by virtue of this your isomerization, you are getting different uh, melting transitions, different uh, therm your uh, mechanical properties. Now, this 
kind of this is one polymer and you can have polyimides these are polyamide you can have polyimides I have shown in the earlier slide earlier slide I, I, I have shown here here you see this is a polyimide the polyimide now these are not so easily processable you cannot melt it so melt processing is not possible when this poly this kind of polyimide were developed uh, it was abandoned due to its lack of processability but scientists could develop its processability by uh, through the root of um, polyamic acid now this imide ring once it is formed then it is difficult to further process so what happens they took the same reagents they, they got a precursor polymer pre polymer of polyamic acid by reacting this actually this is btda btda part benzophenone tetracarboxylic dianhydride sorry pmda i'm sorry this is PMDA, pyromelitic dihanhydride. So, one can take pyromelitic dihanhydride or benzophenone tetracarboxylic dihanhydride. So, this can be used for making high temperature resistant polymers and their processability is difficult. If you want to make polyimides, then you have to go through polyamic acid. Further humidification of this polyamic acid leads to polyimide. Details you will get I refer to this book. There are so details, so many things are there, itself will be become a course. So, only here I can indicate for your information, those who are interested you can take. What is this polymer? You can say. Not showing. This is actually you are not getting in the screen. This polyactyl nitrile. Actually, polyacrylonitrile also enter into intermolecular hydrogen bonding. Nitrogen is there, so that nitrogen uh, enter into hydrogen bonding. Although not not that so strongly as you have seen in case of polyamide. That is why polyacrylonitrile pan <coughs> polymer it is a hardy polymer. This is used for making artificial wool polyacrylonitrile. This also, this pan is also used as a precursor 
polymer for carbon fiber or graphite fiber graphite fiber the solvent for pan is sodium thiocyanate NaCl in which it is highly dissolved aqueous solution aqueous aqueous sodium thiocyanate solution. There is one industry in Holdia CFCL Consolidated Fibers and Chemicals Limited, they manufacture this pan fiber artificial wool. Uh, acrylon uh, synthetic wool is known as um, what is it called in the market? In the market, we get it by in the name of what is that called? Acrylic fiber, acrylic fiber, these are pan fibers acrylic fibers or pan fibers. So, that in this pan fiber, in this pan fiber we find there is extensive hydrogen bonding between this nitrogen and hydrogen. Uh, 